Karen. I don't look like it, but I am. <laughs> and I want to tell you how you know I'm a parent because I had a long night and I'm up here with just a little bit of sleep because I've been gone all week at this training right in St. Louis. And I came back late last night and my children were so excited to see me that they did not want to go to sleep. So my three-year-old sneaks out of the bed, goes into the bathroom, and turns on the radio. I did not know he knew how to do this. He turns the radio, puts the music up loud, and yells, dance party! And him and his sister both get in the bathtub with no water and have a dance party. So I'm like, okay, it's time to go to bed. So you would think I would turn off the radio and say, everyone back to the bed. But I didn't. I started dancing too. Because I couldn't beat them, so I was like, I might as well join them, right? And so I, I was thinking about this this morning because I'm a parent and I work and I have classes and I do all this other stuff. And so a lot of teachers and parents can never meet to communicate because parents are in so many different directions and so are teachers. So what I'm going to talk a little bit about is my own personal experience as a parent and some of the work that I've done as a parent and education organizer in the city and just share how some of the parents have really, uh, teachers have spoke to me with some of the things that they've done to make me be able to know what's going on in my child's classroom and I'll also talk about the work that I've done as an organizer to have parents and teachers be on the same page to advocate for resources. So my three-year-old, the dance party guy, well um, he just started preschool this year and his teacher gave us a survey to fill out at home to bring back. She wanted to learn more about my son. She asked questions about his personality, she asked questions about the way that he learned. And for me, when I was uh, completing the survey, I thought about, well, how does he learn? And what is his personality? And how is he going to be in this new learning environment? So it did two things for me. It made me think about how I, how I was going to be able to reinforce what was happening in school at home. But it also made me think of his personality and how he was going to be now that he was going to be entering into the school system. And I thought, oh man, I'm going to have to volunteer at school because my three-year-old's got a really big personality and I feel really sorry for his preschool teacher. <laughs> um, but I really appreciated how she used this medium where she didn't have to stop and talk to me, but she sent something home and I was able to send back. And then when we do have an opportunity to talk, we can touch bases about those things that she's expecting from me and the things that I'm expecting from her. Now, my daughter's first grade teacher at open house that year, she only had us for 15 minutes. You all know open house is not very long. Um, and what she did, she organized the presentation in a way that she really explored her teaching philosophy with us. She talked about the strategies that she used and why she was using them. She also talked about the expectations. And then she even gave us some little bits of advice about how to reinforce what was going to be happening in the first grade so, so that we could take it home and also reinforce so that our child would do better in the classroom that school year. But that year, we were going through a lot with testing in Chicago public schools. And she had an honest conversation with us about what those tests were going to tell us about our student and what they weren't. And then she was also honest about how she needed help because all of these new tests were really taking away from the time in the classroom where she should be teaching. And she asked if we could be parent volunteers. And it was that honest conversation that she was having with us that made me really think about what was happening in Chicago public schools from a different perspective. And from there, a lot of us in that classroom were, were able to be advocates around what was going on in testing that school year. So those are just two personal examples about how teachers were able to reach out to me, this busy mother, and be able to connect with me about my child's learning. So this is what it looks like. It looks like respect. It looks like meeting parents where they're at. It looks like not stigmatizing parents. So now I want to take you to the neighborhood that I work in, West Humble Park. It's a predominantly low-income, African-American, Latino community on Chicago's west side. And one of the elementary schools I was working in to do some parent leadership with was really struggling. They had a lot of social emotional support issues in the school and was really dealing with the violence that surrounded that school community that had even claimed some of the lives of the students there. They also had a building that was in poor condition. So we began meeting with parents about how to create a long-term campaign to address these needs. At the same time, the teachers were complimenting this organizing campaign by calling parents to tell them the good and the bad and the ugly about what was happening that week and, and, and what was happening with their student. 
And a lot of the parents appreciated that because those parents had been so frustrated by the fact that they only got the bad news about their student. And sometimes they'd be contacted when it was too late. And they didn't like that. They felt disrespected. So they were feeling brand new that the teachers were now calling after school, during school, any way that the teachers could contact, they would try. They even texted a lot. And I thought that was so cool. But what happened was a couple of months after the school year had started, the Chicago Board of Education was about to make a decision that was going to potentially uh, uh, really impact this school in a negative way. And we needed parents to come out and speak about what was happening so great at this school. And it was because of those teachers' relationships with the parents throughout the school year, we were able to turn out almost 300 parents to advocate on the behalf of that school. And if it wasn't for those teachers, we would have never been able to do that. <laughs> And I want to share another example of another school in West Humble Park that was also in very poor building condition. The teachers and the parents worked together to do a survey of the school and find everything that was wrong with that building. The parents then advocated with Chicago Public School administrators for over a year and was able to win $10 million in capital improvements for that school in a time when the district said they had no money. They were able to get air conditioning. They were able to address the third floor. R roof was leaking into the classrooms. They addressed the peeling paint. They also addressed the fact that the playground was in so poor condition that the students couldn't even play on it. And I attribute that all, all that to the teachers and parents coming together and the parents being able to advocate on the behalf of those teachers. See, if there wasn't that kind of communication, the parents would have never known what the teachers were going through in order to actually teach their children. Those parents even went above and beyond and actually helped to write, lobby, and pass Illinois Senate Bill 630, which was the legislation that mandated Chicago public schools to have to be transparent about the needs of school buildings and to be able to create a long-term facility plan that was just passed by the Board of Education last Wednesday. So I share those two stories about those schools in West Humble Park because it was the fact that those parents were able to see what those teachers were trying to accomplish. See, the teachers are working with uh, uh, have to do so much more with so much less, and parents need to understand that. Because if not, then we just think you're you're not doing your job. So we need to have that line of communication and actually actually have parents. Uh, and teachers talk to each other like adults and also center around this conversation about what the, the students' uh, expectations are for that school year and being clear about your teaching philosophy and your strategies. Because you want everyone to be on the same page in the beginning of the school year so that there's no surprises during the middle of the school year. So one of the things I also uh, want to talk about is uh, the different ways that my, my uh, children's teachers and the teachers that I've worked with in West Humble Park have been able to use different mediums. So I talked about the texting and the phone calls after school and during school, but a lot of teachers have been using newsletters so that when the parent does have some downtime, they can go through the newsletter and see what's going on in the classroom and talk to, talk to their child about what's going on. I usually get the gossip first about who likes who and stuff like that, but those deeper, <laughs> deeper conversations about what the child is learning. Um, if it wasn't for those lines of communication, I don't think we would have been able to do the things we did in West Humble Park like we have. Because I want to leave you all with this, because I don't want to talk too much. But teachers' working conditions are students' learning conditions. And <laughs> And once you're, be, you're able to translate what you need to do that school year in those terms, you'll get parents to be able to not just change that classroom, but also can change the system. Thank you. Yeah.